So here's our next vehicle we're going to show off from the National Armor Cavalry Collection here at Fort Benning. This is a famous face, and Hillary is going to tell us all about it. This is a Sturmgeschütz Ausführung G. It was produced, this particular one was produced by Alket in December 1944. So it's very near the end, the end of the war. So we see a lot of what are known as slave features involved in this. But I suppose looking at, to look at the Sturmgeschütz, you have to see where it fitted in. It was an artillery vehicle. It wasn't a uh, tank or a panzer vehicle. It was an artillery vehicle, and its original purpose was to, to destroy bunkers and um, dugouts and so forth. And it was to support the infantry. But in those days, it had a short 75, a little small 75 millimeter gun, and it did a great job um, at destroying bunkers and supporting the infantry. But when the threat of modern Soviet vehicles uh, came along, they were very quickly able to install a long-barreled uh, 75. So initially there was an L43, this one is an L48, it meant L standing for the, the length between the front of the gun and the back of the breech. That's how Germans measured their guns. Um, and that gun was a very accurate and very powerful gun for its time. The, from 1940, late 42 onwards, they had the long barrel gun in them. And then gradually they became more and more involved in protecting ground troops against uh, a tank attack. But in 1943, uh, Heinz Guderian, the uh, famous uh, general Heinz Guderian, was given control of the Panzer Commission and he uh, decided that uh, since he was responsible for all the Panzer Truppen, that they would take control of the Sturmgeschütz production as well as tank production. And then from that point onwards, you got a Sturmgeschütz arriving, not with the artillery, but with, with uh, anti-tank troops. Um, there was one slight difference uh, between the two vehicles. The tank troops had radios that communicated with tank formations, whereas the artillery guys had radios different type of radio, a different set of radios that communicated with the artillery troops. Um, the performance of this under the tank troops wasn't as spectacular as with the artillery troops because the artillery troops had been trained to always avoid any sort of aggressive contact with the enemy. So they tended to hide, line up, uh, defend, whereas the panzer troops uh, who were getting these vehicles for the first time were using them also in, in offence as well as a t as attack and def a def a defence. Uh, the, the vehicle itself, if we look at it, this is one of the latest models, as I said, it has an 80 millimeter armour plate in the front, 80 millimeter uh, in front of the driver's compartment. Um, this one being built by Alket tended to have a, what they called a tough blender, which is a cast gun mantlet. Um, there's no significance in that compared with the welded mantlet, except that they could be produced in a different uh, steel company. And in late 44, they introduced a coaxial machine gun with this, and that's what the hole on the side. But they spent most of the war, they didn't have that coaxial machine gun. This vehicle also has on the roof, but it's missing from this museum exhibit, it has a what the Germans call a Rundumfeuer machine gun, which is a 360 degree traverse machine gun that was operated by, from, on a periscopic site for the, so they could defend their vehicle with that. They also had on the roof at this period, they have what was called a Navarteidungswaffe, which was a close-in defense weapon where they could fire a grenade type uh, device uh, in any direction from the top of the vehicle to deter any attack by infantry squads. So maybe we'd uh, walk around the vehicle a little bit and talk about some of the features. Okay, well we were talking first about the gun, it's an L48, but here in front of the vehicle, the museum have very cleverly sighted a, a gun that was basically a, an L24 from the original design for the Sturm uh, This one actually has a slightly longer barrel on it, but this is mounted on a um, improvised uh, mount for using in uh, concrete defences. So it's a, what's known as a gun for the festival trooper, the fortress troops. 
So nothing that was manufactured was ever allowed to go to waste. So this breech and the recoil cylinders and so forth are all from one of these or maybe one of the other vehicles that use that type of, of gun. Okay, going back to the extinguishers, um, here we have the uh, driver's uh, compartment. He's in a, in a compartment way off down here in front. This here at the side is a pistol port or a vision port, a little small hole for him to look out. And in emergencies, the driver was meant to get out through one of these uh, hatches here at the front. It's uh, quite an interesting challenge to, to, to make the contortions to get in and out of that. But if we look along the side of the vehicle, this is one of the few vehicles in the world that still is, has intact the Schurzen holders. Now, to talk about Schurzen, it's a whole science in itself, because what happened in 1941-42 was that more and more Russian anti-tank uh, teams were coming on stream with the Russian anti-tank rifle, which actually could penetrate the vertical side armor of a Panzer III that's only 30 millimeter in there. And this threat hadn't been envisaged, uh, but with large numbers of these anti-tank uh, teams with their anti-tank rifles, they could knock out one of these vehicles. They mightn't uh, knock it out completely, it mightn't go on fire or anything like that, but enough to stop it in an attack. So uh, at first the idea was, oh, we have to design new vehicles with thicker armor on the sides. But then uh, one of the German scientists came up with this concept of hanging 5.5 millimeter plates on either side. They were relatively loosely hung, but when the Russian anti-tank rifle round came through the plate, hit the plate, the energy would be dissipated before it struck the main plate, and that worked perfectly. So that's the shorts. And, but here we have the original uh, racks for the Type 2 shorts, and, which is this cylindrical one which they could hang the shorts and plates over, uh, running all the way back, protecting all the sides of the vehicle. So it has certain features that people are interested in, the technicalities would like. Alcat were the only people to do this return roller with the wheel, with the six small holes in it. Alcat were the only people to do a forged uh, support for the track guard. Um, it's probably not very clear on the video because the vehicle is covered in dust, but this is an immaculate example of a original color scheme for Stumgeschütz from 1944. You have mostly green, this is a green patch here, you have a lot of dark brown, and although it's not very clear, there is Dunkelgelb, the yellow is here. Now the intriguing thing about this also is that if you clean off the top of these uh, track guards, they're in red primer, they've never been painted. So you could say that this vehicle is a four color scheme or maybe even a five color scheme because there's certain other things on it. So, but this is the original paint scheme and there are very few vehicles that actually have that. Um, yeah. This is a, a mounting for the spare wheel. Uh, not in place at the moment. And here are the original markings from, for this unit. Uh, the wolf's head. But what might be intriguing for people is the Balkan Kreutz, which normally has a white outline. The white outline has been overpainted in red. And at the end of the war, in December onwards, they were painting the crosses with the red outline because they had realized that the enemy were targeting the vehicles by seeing the white outlines of the cross. So that's what the color you need for your late war vehicles if you're making models of it. Right, so starting with where the crew were in this vehicle, you have the Stone Cannon 40 uh, back here. But as I say, it has more or less a field gun uh, mounting for this gun. But it was a very inexpensive uh, solution to this problem. Um, the design came from a very famous engineer called Michaels, who was the chief engineer of the Alcat company. And uh, there's a book coming out now which will talk all about his history. Uh, a colleague in Germany is just about to publish that. And this was a standard Panzer III chassis with this armor body placed on top. 
where the shirt kind of is mounted in between on it. There's a big series of girders goes from each side of the hull to mount that. Then on top of the vehicle, you can see where the crew were. Here, on the right side of the vehicle, is the loader's hatch. In front, though missing, is the position for the uh, 360 degree rotation machine gun mount. And in front is the Navratilos rocker. Navratilos rocker for throwing out grenades and so forth. And these other uh, items sticking up are what's known as pilsen, which were for screwing in a, uh, the poles for a two-ton crane so they could do self-maintenance on a vehicle. And the commander sat over here in his own area back here, and he has a rotating hatch. Uh, so he could rotate, he has seven periscopes that he can rotate and see around him. This one is a bit jammed on this museum angle. The gunner sat in front of him, and this is the, the position of the gun sight here, up through here, projected through here. And as I say, the coaxial machine gun runs forward just alongside the gun. That was only a feature that they put in towards the end to conserve ammunition, because prior to that, they were wasting high explosive ammunition attacking infantry, but they could deal with the machine gun there. The two radio antennas at the rear, uh, radio sets, uh, depending on the type of vehicle it was, the uh, radio sets alongside the commander and the gunner. And uh, if it was a command vehicle, they had more powerful radios on the right side. And they had, a, they had a, an antenna, which was the so-called stern antenna, the star antenna, for the bottom range activities. Conventional Panzer III type rear engine deck and rear hull, so nothing very special about this. But as I say, the features of this vehicle, when you examine it, Carefully is that it has its original color scheme on it, um, even though it's covered in dust. Uh, along here, I can see all of this track guard red primer. Amazing. Okay.